at the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley in California in, on a Sunday night in 1947, Pastor Robert Munger preached a sermon entitled, The Story of My Heart, Christ's Home. Well, after the message, uh, another ministry leader invited him to come to a conference that summer and preach that message uh, again. And then after that, he was invited to uh, Wheaton College to speak in their chapel, and he preached the same sermon uh, again. It became a, a popular favorite. Um, and at one of those uh, meetings, I believe it was at uh, Wheaton College, that a student recorded his message on that old uh, cassette tape uh, player, and, and uh, he transcribed it and then made copies for his friends to give out as a disciple people. Uh, and eventually, a copy of it got into the hands of an editor at, at InterVarsity Press, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, it is estimated that it has been printed over and over and over, over 10 million times in, in a, over a dozen different languages. Um, over the years, well, uh, Pastor Munger, in this allegory, uh, in, this, in his little, in his sermon, uh, he takes the Christian to each room in his house and shows how Christ is to have is Lord over every area of our life. In this wonderfully simple yet thorough exhortation, Munger exhorts us on living the Christian life. Over the years, I, I, I've picked up my own copy many times. In fact, I also have a, a hardback copy of it, uh, and I've picked it up many times over the years just for my own uh, edification. Uh, and, and during this uh, time of lockdown, it, it was brought up again as Wendy and I were talking one night, and I thought, I, I'm going to read that again. Uh, and, and as I did, um, I had this thought that I would borrow the allegory but change the, the building for our own weekly Bible study. And so my hope is that this will be an encouragement to you with regard, not as he did with the rooms of a house, but with the rooms of the church. And that this would be an encouragement to you with regard to the value of the church, the body of Christ. And so I've entitled this series, Our Church, Christ's Home. It's my prayer that after we complete the next nine uh, weeks of Bible study together, that we'll gain a deeper appreciation for the body of Christ, a, a stronger drive for serving in the body, but most importantly, a deeper, far greater love for the head of the body, our Lord Jesus Christ. May Christ always be exalted and obeyed by his people. May we learn more and more every day how we can better glorify him and enjoy him. Well, from the very beginning of time, God designed man to live in his presence. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden where they would worship him and serve him. We're told that Adam was able to walk with God in the cool of the day. It's beyond understanding, really, or imagination. But that's what, how the scripture describes their relationship. That Adam, being sinless, enjoyed being in God's presence physically as a friend could walk with a friend in the cool of the garden. He and Eve, he and Eve lacked nothing, but they enjoyed everything. Well, we know the, sadly, we know the rest of the story, don't we? On the day that they ate from the forbidden tree, man died, just like God had warned. For a brief time before this, Adam lived in fullness of what King David described in Psalm 1 and the man who delights in God. In Psalm 1 verse 3, it says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Until Adam sinned, he was fruitful and he, and, and he did not wither. In everything that Adam did, he prospered. He lived in perfect union with the triune God. Adam's life in the presence of God was exactly as God intended. He was made to worship God and to enjoy him. Now, what's really beyond amazing to me is that after Adam and Eve sinned and, and God banished them from the garden, God did not banish man from him. I mean, just think about God's mercy 
as he drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, he provided the instruction and the means for man to continue to worship God. I mean, the, the details aren't given to us in God's word, but it's clear that they were given instruction as to how and what to bring God as an offering. In chapter 4, Abel's offering was accepted by God, but Cain's offering was not according to God's instruction. Now, without going into the details of Genesis 4, it's clear that God was still calling man to worship him. He was banished from the garden, but not from relationship with God. Even in his sinful fallen state, man was still called to worship and to serve God. However, through Cain and Abel, we also see the beginning of the great divide of humanity. One who honored God and one who despised God. Now, as the story of humanity continued to unfold, God called Abraham to leave his family in Ur and go to the place that God would guide him, to which God would guide him. God called Abraham to live in his presence, to offer sacrifices to him, to believe in him. And we're told in Romans uh, that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's Romans 4, 3. Well, Abraham and his wife Sarah uh, had a son, as you know, named Isaac. However, Abraham also fathered another son, didn't he? Ishmael. But once again, we see the sovereignty of God in man's salvation. God chose Isaac to be the promised son, and he rejected Ishmael. When Isaac grew up and got married to Rebekah, the Lord continued to show his sovereign will in the birth of Isaac's twins, Jacob and Esau. And God also revealed that painful truth and difficult truth that he loved Jacob but it says he hated Esau. In Romans 9, 10, verses, or 9, verses 10 through 13, we read it, and not, only, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. As difficult as that sounds in our modern ears, God was making known once again, he had a chosen people that were designed to worship him, that he would preserve. Now we could keep walking through the, the rest of the Bible and we'd see that over and over and over again, but just consider these three examples. God chose Abel over Esau. God chose Jacob over, uh, I mean, he, he chose Abel over Cain. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau. In all three of those examples, God determined beforehand to save and to preserve a people that were made for himself to worship him. In the, New in the Old Testament, these people were called the community. As in Genesis 28, when Isaac blessed his son Jacob, and he said, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. Now, in the New Testament, this, this is the word ecclesia, which literally means to be called out of and into. To be called out of one place and into another. Just as Abraham was called out of the land of, the Ur, of Ur and into the presence of God where God would lead him. The ecclesia in the New Testament is a group of people who have been called out of the world and into God, into his family. It is the church. It is the people of God. The, the Apostle Peter used this language in, in his first letter. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10, we hear the same language, the same formula, uh, this uh, Hebraic formula 
uh, Old Testament pattern. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And, and that brings us to the main point of, of this series that we're going to do. Our church, Christ's home. The church, the ecclesia, is Christ's home. He abides in his people. And he must be honored in everything that we do as individuals, certainly, but as a church. Let's not give in to the common culture of the modern church. In too many places today, the, the church has merely become an institution, either of mutual comfort and aid or for entertainment and selfish ambitions. I mean, we've all seen churches that care for their community wonderfully. A variety of good deeds, but they don't preach the gospel. Or if they do, it's a watered-down gospel. They don't declare that judgment is coming and man needs to get right with God. No, the declaration is you're fine as you are. Let's help you. We love everybody. God loves everybody as they are. It's a very universalistic uh, message that many churches preach today. It's an institution that is caring only for the material needs, the comforts and needs of people. But then there's also the other uh, extreme of the same, same problem, that churches have become institutions of entertainment and, and satisfying selfish ambitions. Again, we have seen this in many places as well, where it's all about entertaining people, giving people their, their instant gratification. Many churches have fallen into that trap. The church is not an institution that is designed to give you comfort, entertain you, or merely meet your needs. You are the church, the body of Christ, a spiritual house being built by God, a dwelling place where God abides by his spirit. You are united to fellow Christians around the world throughout the ages as the household of the living God. All of what I just said, there are all those descriptive titles of the church can be seen in, in three passages. I want you to look these up as I, as I read them. Again, 1 Peter, this time chapter 2, verse 4. Look at verse 4 and 5 in 1 Peter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are a part of a spiritual house, a structure that God is building. Then Jesus said, this is my church. I am building my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is building us up and building us together. We are a spiritual house. And then Ephesians 2. Turn to Ephesians 2. Verse 19, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer stra strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place, for God by the Spirit, we are a dwelling place for God by His Spirit that has a firm foundation with Christ Himself as the cornerstone. Now, that's a, those two passages, I'm sure, but especially this one. We'll come back to in this series as we talk about the, the building and the structure of the, the physical church. But Christ is the cornerstone. And that's another theme that you'll hear all throughout these nine weeks, I'm sure. And one more passage, 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14. He said, I hope to come to you soon. Talk, Paul, the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy. 
I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church, the living, the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. There's another rich description of the church that we'll come back to, but we are the household of the living God. Now, again, Lord willing, we'll come back to these three passages throughout this series, these nine weeks. But it should be encouraging for us tonight to know that you are not called by God to live in isolation. I mean, these days of self-quarantining and isolation are getting really, really old, aren't they? We desperately need one another. And by God's grace, we can see in those scriptures that we aren't called we are not called to live in isolation. We are called by God to be his people, his household. God called Abel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you and me so that we might worship him and serve him as the body. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We are his belonging. Therefore, we have a great privilege. And I, I mean that. It's not a, I don't see this as a duty. We have a great privilege to live for him and to worship him. In the next nine weeks, we'll be walking through the church building together. I thought this is also a good time to do this with these spring rains. It's harder to get out into the, into the community and some of these other locations. So I thought, well, spring rains, this is a great idea. We'll be walking throughout the church building in order to examine and encourage us by answering some simple questions. One, how is God worshipped and glorified in this room, whichever room we go to? Two, what is God doing in my life through this room? And three, how can the world be blessed by what we do in this room? And we will consider other things as well. But those are some of the general questions that we'll be asking as we make our way around the church and examining what the scripture says about the church, the ecclesia, the people of God. Join me each week as we continue to see that, yes, this is our church, but it's Christ's home. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know that we do belong to you, that we are not living on our own in isolation, this, this Christian life, but you have called us into fellowship with you through your son, who then now unites us together as a family. Lord, help us as we consider this so, such a valuable and important topic of the body of Christ by this analogy of the church building. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's keep growing and let's go.